Hello. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Please feel free to come closer. It's a nice warm crowd. Thank you so much. My name is Allison Dougherty, and I work with the Manhattan Theatre Club Education. And we are um, quite fortunate to be joined by two panelists. Um, the first being our playwright, Anthony Giardina. novelist as well and has been nominated for Drama Desk Awards and the Outer Critics Circle Award um, and of course has written <coughs> Dan Cody's Young. Um, we also have Lauren Holland who is a senior credit analyst for City Sites Incorporated um, among many other credits which you can uh, read in your program. Uh, she holds an MBA in finance and entrepreneurship from the University of Chicago, and thank you so much for joining us. This is pretty interesting to me. Uncommon bedfellows sometimes, someone from Wall Street and, and from the arts. Um, so from Main Street. And from Main Street, that's right. So, we thought we'd begin um, with Anthony. I'm curious because I know you've seen the show more than a few times, and I know um, just with with the news and, and our lives that we live, I find that night to night, something different lands, even when we're so familiar with the show. Is there anything that landed with you, particularly um, in tonight's production, that stayed with you, or? I, I guess what keeps landing, is this working? Is this yeah. Yeah. I guess what keeps landing for me is Kara's fear of money in the second act, which for me is so resonant and you know, in the, in the course of developing this play, I've had a lot of conversations with people. And, and I don't want to say this, but it happens to be true, and you'll hate me, particularly with women, mm -hmm. who have come up to me and said, I don't want to know this stuff. Yeah. I just don't want to know this stuff. And so the question for me is always, if you don't want to know this stuff, and yet it's ruling your life, at least in part, how do you negotiate existence? Mm. So that, for me, is, is something I'm listening to, I guess, harder as I watch the play. And I love that you kept saying, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, um, definitely. So, you know, as a, a woman um, who works on Wall Street, and, you know, I've been in this business for almost 20 years now. Um, so, you know, I'm definitely not afraid of money. Um, so I, you know, I not only, not only face this, you know, in sort of my professional life, but also, um, you know, as a member of, um, you know, as a lifetime member of my sorority, still an active member of my sorority, I serve as the budget and finance chair of my chapter here in, in, uh, in Manhattan, North Manhattan alumni chapter of Del Sigma Theta Sorority. I want my sorority sisters here in the audience. But, so, you know, we have these discussions about, we're, you know, we're public service sorority, so, you know, we still function here in, in the, um, you know, in the city. But we have, whenever we have discussions about money, at chapter meeting. I see, you know, everybody's eyes glaze <laughs> over and, you know, they hand out the, you know, look at the finance reports and like, you know, no one wants to talk about it. It's like always going to move on, you know, but no one ever wants to talk about it. But it's just, the, but it's also the one thing that's always the biggest point of contention, right? And, but then at the same time, you know, after, you know, I'll get up and I'll make my report and, you know, we'll, you know, I'll go through things, you know, in a very detailed fashion, but then, after the meeting, someone will always come up to me and say, you know, hey, can you come and, you know, can I call, can I take you all to lunch? Can we talk about, like, my budget? Or can you help me, you know, with my, with my investment plan? Or can, you know, can you help me, um, you know, reallocate my 401k? Now, mind you, this is not what I do. I'm not a financial advisor. You know, even though that's what everyone thinks that I do. Everyone thinks, like, oh, you thinks I'm a stockbroker, I'm a financial advisor. That's not what I do. You know, I'm an, I'm an investment analyst. I'm a credit analyst. You know, I, I, I advise, you know, people that, you know, manage institutional money. But everybody still thinks I'm a, a stockbroker or whatever. But very much true. Like, you know, this fear of money um, is something that is not at all complex. But, you know, as, as Kara says, you, know, you see this reflected through the play that, makes it seem like it's so complex and so esoteric, but at the end of the day, it's really not that, it's not that complex at all. It's something that everyone needs to have a very basic level, a very operating level understanding of, very much so. 
I found a scene between uh, Kevin and Kara in the first act when it's almost like a seduction scene, really, where he says, it's like a striptease, right? Show me your finances. <laughs> I was almost rattled by that scene. Um, how did you, how did that scene germinate? Where, and, and, and additionally, how did you begin writing this play? Well, the first question, how that seemed germinated, it's kind of, as I told you before, it's kind of what I want to do with everybody. I, I, I belong to a, um, a little group of uh, four men who go out to dinner, and we talk Contrary very expensive interesting. Expensive wine and... and it's not that expensive, but, but <laughs> no, we, we, we talk about everything, literally everything, and we had never talked about money. And then one night we said, let's all of us open ourselves up and say what we've got. And we did, and it, it, the intimacy of that, and the looking at somebody and be, being able to be honest, sort of was, you know, I loved that experience. So I, I kind of, it's one of the things I like to do with people. I've been working with my daughter for years. She said, will you just let me do this with you and I can help you? Because it's so basic to have somebody come in and not be scared of it. Anyway, that's a long-winded answer. But the second question, it came out of a whole different thing. The play came out of um, my finding a story uh, that had actually happened. These two towns in eastern Massachusetts, Acton, Massachusetts, and Maine, very different towns. Acton, very wealthy, a lot of MIT people lived there. Maynard, an old factory town. Acton had a great high school, Maynard had a terrible high school. They were going to merge. Um, for the benefit of everybody, and Acton voted it down. And I thought, what a great story, a way to talk about the way we try and protect our kids by giving them advantages that we don't want others to have. And, you know, and by writing that story, I wanted to layer in how money functions in, in family life. That landed with me this evening, um, the, the parental aspect of it, how primal it is to want to fulfill your job to have done a good job for your children, whether they want it or not, right? I really, I really heard that tonight. It's a, it's a deep, deep vein mm -hmm. in the show. Um, Lauren. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if we were to wave a wand of um, a writer's instincts, which you may have in any event, it, um, in your experience, even though I know you're not a direct financial advisor, you probably have had such experience with people's personal lives in terms of finance and risk. If you were to write a play, where do you think you might start just based on your experience with people and money and finance? What strikes you as maybe an interesting starting point? Um, well, the thing about this play is sort of like, um, it, it was really about his motivation and it really, I don't, you know, it, it really kind of became apparent more so at the end, because um, the question was like, what was his motivation of actually doing this? Was it more about him, or was it about, or what was it about Kara? Um, because particularly, you know, when it was, you know, this whole thing about him being willing to cross the line, um, and and to you know to you know to tiptoe on that line and to, and to do you know it's going insider trading, right? Mm -hmm. So. Was it because he um, was actually corrupt, or was it that he was willing to, to take this risk and do it because he was going to do it for her, right? So it was really sort of like, what was the motivation for him to cross the line? It's like, had, was it something that he was al always been doing? Which I think we, we were able to see that it wasn't something he'd actually ever done before, but the fact that he was actually willing to do it for her. So I think I would probably start with you know um, you know someone's motivation and like sort of like what initially kind of got them you know, sort of like into the business. So what was that sort of you know that original kind of spark um, that introduced them into you know you know into the business? How did you get into the business of finance? Um, so I my original introduction to the financial markets came when I was really young. Um, like when I was probably maybe five or six years old, my grandmother taught me how to read stock pages. Um, <laughs> she, was a, she was an operator. She worked for the phone company, which was Illinois Bell. I'm from Chicago originally. So Illinois Bell, like she got shares in that company, which eventually became Ameritech and then eventually became AT&T. So um, that was like sort of my early introduction. And I always sort of had this interest in the financial markets. 
Um, even though I initially didn't go into that business, I studied engineering in undergrad, so I actually did that um, well before I decided to go to business school and you know go into Wall Street. But I found eventually found my way into the business, even though I had sort of had like this roundabout path before I um, found my way to, to finance. Um, that, I just have to say, that is fascinating. <laughs> everybody's grandmother did that with them. Yeah. And that's your play. That's your you and your grandmother. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was, that was my introduction. That's a great opener. So I, I noticed the word risk this evening, too, in the script. The word risk comes up so often. That's what, risk that's what, that's what and what hunger. What, I mean, I wonder, how would, how would you um, categorize yourselves when it comes to risk, do you think you are risk takers? Are you are you hungry? Or are, I mean, is an analyst maybe a little more distant? No, I'm not risky. You have to. I mean, risk. I'm, I mitigate risk. Right. Every single day. Like that is that's what I do. Is that I incorporate a lot of information and I mitigate risk and and, and take risk every single day. Calculated risk. That's what I'm designed to do and paid to do every single day. But in your personal investment, how do you how do you deal with Same this? thing. Same thing. So you're very careful. Yes. Yeah. I'm not actually. I'm not. I, I I feel like, you know, when Kevin says at a certain point to Kara, um, you know, people who are comfortable with money do not read their monthly statement and say, Oh my God. You know, call up the stockbroker and say, you know, I'm down this month, sell everything. No. You just no. don't do no, that. You can't. You, you understand that there, and here I am talking as if I really know this stuff, but <laughs> you, you, know, you understand that there is a wave you're riding that could crash, and if you're going to do it, you just have to do it. Yeah, well, no, yeah, exactly. I mean, with the ball, I mean, you know the ball is coming, right? But you can absolutely cannot, like, yeah, if, you, if, you, if you're like that, like, you, yeah, you can't, like, again, you can't. Monitor like your portfolio like that like oh my god yeah. like, I mean, look I mean people anybody that like completely cashed out in like 2008 2009 time frame like never made their money back when the market came back right right, right. I mean it's it's the absolute truth I mean you can look at the numbers and look at the returns like you totally did not make your money back um so, so um but again it has it's, you know it's cal it's calculated risk you know mitigated risk but um and that's why you have professionals. You know, to do this, this is why you actually have you know investment professionals to do this for you. But again, you still have to have a basic level understanding. So when you do have a conversation with your stockbroker, you do know exactly what it is they're doing, and you have the ability to judge between like someone that is actually giving you good advice versus bad advice. You know, like someone that is basically telling you to put all your money in like you know some sort of you know complex option strategy is probably not the best person to be investing your money. Right? Someone that's giving you a balanced portfolio, diversified portfolio, is probably giving you better advice. So. And the tragic thing, uh, and you know this, um, in this play, when Kara comes in and says, I've lost a third, there was this event, and probably some of you remember it, in late summer 2015, when there was a market correction. And, and if you looked at your statement, you had lost a third. And a week later, you regained it. Right. But you, when you panic, as Kara does, and say, oh my god, what if it keeps going down? What if it keeps going down? And you sell out, as you're saying. Are we giving investment advice yeah. here? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about the play. Yes, well, how does it hurt? Wait, it's not great. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of risk in that and in some level, um, education that is affordable versus the sort of the, the, the private school track of education. Um, is that something you've been thinking about beforehand or experienced that search, or did it come into the plot later? You know, I, I live in um, a very liberal, progressive town, Northampton, Massachusetts. <laughs> and. Um, Everybody is a very good person. No, I shouldn't say that. Not everybody is a very good person. But I live among a lot of very good people with good progressive politics. And most of them, the ones with money, did things to give their kids advantages that kids whose parents did not have so much money would not have, such as pay for SAT training, 
such as pay for somebody to work on their uh, uh, college essay. And I think about this quite a bit. There's a wonderful article, if anybody hasn't seen it, the lead article in the Atlantic Magazine this month, which is really putting its finger at people like me who have progressive politics, but still when it comes to our kids, we're going to make sure we're not progressive. We're going to protect them and try to give them an advantage, sometimes at the disadvantage of other kids. Um, so that's something I have thought about for years and wanted to be in this way. And why did the people of, for instance, Acton, Massachusetts, vote against bringing in poorer kids to get the advantage? Because it would hurt their own kids. <coughs> the SAT scores, the mean would go down, everything would go down. It would be a less attractive um, high school. Doug Hughes and I, who's not here tonight, but the director, visited Acton High School and we went into the guidance office and it was like stepping into the CIA. There were more people working there, and there were visitors from all these elite colleges because this was a high school where you know they knew they were going to get prime kids. If that changes because other kids are brought in, those guidance counselors, those uh, college scouts, if that's what they are, go somewhere else. So that, that kind of fascinates me about how we all feel we're tearing down the wall while making sure we are taking care of our it's interesting, I think if we're thinking of the same article, um, it, it, it's referring to the 9.9% really, right? As opposed to the 1%. Exactly, the 9 .9. as opposed to, and the 9.9% actually holds 60% of, of the wealth in this country. So I think we're used to hearing the 1% and the 99%, but it's really that top layer of cream um, plain clothes too, right? Yeah. Uh, wearing t-shirts, wear not wearing suits, um, and they hold 25 times the wealth that they would have um, in 1963, right? In the same position. It's pretty interesting. With very humble appearance, right? So, um, in, in uh, do you, any thoughts regarding education and public education versus private or uh, what's your experience in your in your world in your financial world does it matter at your level um, absolutely so I went to um, I went to public university undergrad to University of Oklahoma um, but with you know sort of with a a, a a bit of a niche because I was a National Merit Scholar so I went on a full ride um, but I went to a private, you know, for my MBA program. So I was University of Chicago. So um, I definitely think it matters. Like I wouldn't have gotten to Wall Street if I had not gone to the University of Chicago. Like I, that was very intentional. Like I was not getting to, you know, where I am straight from, you know, from undergrad. Um, so it was definitely calculated. Um, you know, the seats are limited. So I mean, it, you know, statistic, right? So. Goldman Sachs, let's say Goldman Sachs has 50,000 employees, right? But there are only really 500 of them that actually do make the firm's revenue. The rest of them are there pretty much to support those 500 for all intents and purposes, right? So this, the, those, really, those real top revenue making seats are very limited as far as the access that you have to actually get them. And you know, there are certain credentials and you know, things that you need to have to actually be able to access those seats. And it's the same with pretty much every other, you know, investment bank on the street, and then we start talking about hedge funds and private equity shops and all the like. But, I mean, it's a very, you know, privileged, pedigreed, um, you know, set of individuals that actually do, you know, manage, um, you know, manage money and, you know, have access to, you know, this type, this type of wealth um, that there is on Wall Street. So, um, yeah, I definitely think it, it actually, it matters. I mean, there are outliers where, you know, you have the, the guy that, like, only went, you know, maybe gone to, like, the University of Denver and, you know, got to be, like, the, you know, the, you know a billionaire or something like that. But it's, you know, it's, it's the, the rare exception. Right. So you knew, so I just want to ask, so you knew that you had to go to the University of Chicago in order to get where you wanted to go? A, a top business school, top five, you know, business school, top finance program, absolutely. 
Does that, I'm just curious, does anybody make it anymore? Because sometimes you hear about it in the old days, there were runners that were just guys with no education at all. From the mill room. Like, yeah, yeah. They, 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 they have a story, and now the eighth grade remix story, not, no. not, no, not really, not, not so much <laughs> that's, anymore. That's tragic. Yeah, I mean, even so, like, you know, the programs, like, on, on the cell side, like, even the analyst and associate programs have been trimmed back, and, yeah, not, yeah, not so much anymore. Okay. I just wanted that. It's the rare yes. exception these days. Mm. Some real back story. Um, I'd like to open it up to the audience. I'm sure maybe you have some um, insights or some questions uh, from the performance or from anything we've been discussing. Yes. Um, what are we supposed to explain at the end? You know, it kind of went flat for me when uh, when he says you know, we haven't told each other everything, and she looks as though she's really interested to hear it, and then at the end. I just thought, you know, what what were we supposed to imagine that he was going to say or they were going to talk about? I do deliberately want you to try to imagine what he's going to say. And I, I got an email the other day from somebody who saw the show and he said he and his wife drove home and they, they imagined everything from him declaring that he loves her mm -hmm. to him announcing that he is in fact the devil. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm sorry it went flat, but I do want that 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 moment for you to inhabit the play in a way that you can imagine. There wasn't anything. It wasn't as if they stayed there and we didn't hear what they said. He walked away, so there was no revelation no. ever. No. Yeah. Does yeah. You can follow him off stage in your mind on your way home. Yes. Um, there's such this sense of non-trust, sorry Lauren, about these bankers that I really thought he was going to say he was not gay and that that was all some sort of ruse that he had to sort of, you know, get into her pants, so to speak, that, you know, he was not, so not trustworthy. So I was really surprised that it ended the way that it did. I wasn't surprised about that part of it. I didn't think it would come to that. But how do you convey to uh, the cynics here in the audience the particular character when you know we we all know the Bernie Madoffs of the world? How do you reconcile that and and the the fact that you know she does look at her statements? Where when you're with Bernie Madoff, you don't have to look. You just know you make it all this money until you discover. Hey, guess what? It doesn't exist. So how do you reconcile this character in the world where everybody, <laughs> everybody's I, a wolf? I asked a similar question of Lauren um, earlier, and you, you may want to ask you can see. And I'll, and I'll tell you exactly what I, what I told her earlier. If you're cheating, it's because you're dumb. <laughs> Smart people don't have to cheat. Bernie Madoff didn't know, didn't know what he was doing. Like he was never, there was never, there were never any investments. You're right, but the recipients. No, but the, my point is that there were never any investments. You know what I'm saying? That whole thing was, it was always a fraud. You know what I'm saying? So that's the thing is that like, you know, it's, there, there are th literally thousands of professionals, if not more, like, you know, around the world that go to work every day, myself included, they actually do our jobs and literally make billions and billions of dollars for our clients by giving good advice. You can visit our website, creditsites.com. You know, so I mean, we give. You know, so many of you, I'm sure, all you all have, you know, retirement accounts. I'm sure, raise your hands. So you know, nobody, nobody has retirement. You know, all you all have retirement accounts. So I, I, I guarantee you, my firm literally has thousands of clients, and your my firm's clients manage your retirement accounts. So, you know, we are giving all great investment advice and there are, you know, literally thousands of people that do, do my same job, like every day, they're giving great investment advice. We are the majority, the vast majority of people that work on Wall Street. Guys like Madoff are in the, like, the vast, vast minority, but because they are making, because it makes a good story, his story is the one to get told. You will never see me on television because <laughs> I'm not interesting. <laughs> like, like what I like, I wrote a report today about the Brazilian truck, trucker strike and the impact it's going to have on the steel and paper markets. 
that's not interesting. It's not like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, but you've seen American read on TV. Yeah, you've never seen American read. Yeah. But if I, if I so, could just uh, <laughs> piggyback on that. You know, the one thing that I think, uh, in defense of Kevin, he's always utterly honest with her. He yeah, says, yeah. there is no trust. There are no guarantees. It goes up and it goes down. There's no more sophisticated way. Just take that in and make your decision. Are you going to go with it or are you not going to go with it? I have a question for Mr. Giardini. Um, you know, I am working finance as well, and I had a really tough time with Kevin's character and trying to refine or define some type of redeeming quality about him. Mm -hmm. I thought that it was strange that he didn't host any of these meetings with her in his office. They were all in his home or, you know, there were that level of secrecy, um, you know, in our business. And I work more on the advice side but for institutions, so they really know what they're doing. They hire all kinds of warrants and pay them lots of money, so I just kind of find what they're looking for. But I thought from a suitability standpoint, when he sat with her and said, tell me your budget and then put her in the investments that he put her in, I just didn't, I, it was tough for me to find some type of redeeming quality about him. So in, was he the protagonist in your, in your story or the, or the antagonist? What would you say? I, I can't define him that way. I don't, I don't think there's any redeeming quality about Kevin except that he comes into this woman's life and in a very inappropriate way. I mean, your, your, your insights are, are totally legitimate. You know, he just says, I can change your life. And I'm going to do it not in my office, not, you know, in, by conventional means, but just in a relationship. And she goes with it. So, you know, and in the end, he does make her money and would make her money if she had stayed in. So, though, though I can't find redeeming qualities in Kevin, I do want to say, you know, he's not Bernie Madoff. Um, and, and yes, he does it in his own way, but that's, I guess that would, that's what makes a play. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think the whole thing about this whole experience is that it was uncomfortable. Like, and growth is uncomfortable, right? Growth is uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable process, right? And um, at the end of the day, um, you know, Karen and her daughter pretty much rejected the process because right when it got to that point and it got uncomfortable, they failed. And they wound, effectively wound up right back where they started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I like, I like the underlying question: How will we know who we are? Right. They say that about about the kids um, transferring schools. How will they know who they are? Right. So if we if we change that much, can we ever come back? Yeah. Well, look, I, I will tell you this, um, and, I'll, and I'll leave you with this one. And I think that this is. Um, sort of like we kind of kind of kept going through my mind you know it's something it's sort of like my guiding principle and kind of you know how i deal with people in these types of situations is what i call lauren's zero law <laughs> lauren's zero law never want something more for someone than they want it for themselves and kevin wanted this more for, yep. for them than they wanted it for themselves right mm -hmm. so that's, and that's where everything just kind of broke, broke down. Yeah, I think that's terrific. Like, that is how, that's, that's like, you know, I, I'll get to, I, I get to a certain point with people, but it's like when I realize that I want something more for them than they want it for themselves, that's it. I disagree. So <laughs> I disagree with that. That's where my investment, that's where my investment is. Oh, we have a disagreement. I'm sorry. No, I disagree with that. I think that, that she has the, a problem of survival. Mm -hmm. And, and going along with, with somebody who does not, under, she's already made commitments. She's made commitments. She owes money. She's got to have X amount of money. She can't really afford ups and downs like that in the yeah. market. She should be very, very cautiously invested if she's invested at all. She should probably be invested, but but not with a guy like Kevin. <laughs> well, I mean, remember, like, we, he laid out, we, he laid out basically like her balance sheet, right? Which was affecting her balance sheet. As, you know, we did a restructuring. Like I mean, she, she had nothing to lose. She, she was in the negative. Like she had no equity, right? Like, for, 
She had 85,000. She had a little equity in her house and 10,000 in savings. So she had 85,000. Yeah, but, but eventually she's going to burn through that, right? Because she was cash flow negative every single month. So effectively, like at a at certain point, at, uh, after a while, like that, that was going to be gone. Mm -hmm. Well, let's discuss that. Because I actually think she could, you know, no, we don't, we don't want to get into the things here. But, I, but I, 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 it, well, well, in my view, say, say. you know, you have $400 a month in, in college loans. You, you know, every month you don't, you know, you don't spend that somewhere else. So I think she could actually make it on her 81000 Maybe that's not clear in the plan. Maybe we need another sheet. No, well, she, I mean, she definitely did do some, some budget restructuring. But nonetheless, the point is that she, had, she needed to be doing something. But... You know, I agree. She and I do agree that it was you know the, the strategy. I don't know. I mean that that market, the market dislocation did happen that month. I mean she probably was maybe overweight equities, but you know nonetheless she needed to do something. But the point is that she got to a point where she got uncomfortable, and as opposed to being able to to continue to grow, you know she bailed. Right. And she wound up. Right. And again, in, in my view, all of the points that Kevin is making to her about just if you're going to go with it, go with it, that's where it falls apart. Yeah. Yeah. I have to ask you, have you been watching Billions? Absolutely. <laughs> every single day, and play. every single day, Taylor is my spirit animal. And one day when I was coming into work, they were actually filming outside of my office. And I wow. like, had a total down. I actually had to help me with one of the characters. It was amazing. <laughs> Do you have uh, maybe another question? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I have the sense, and I think you said, Lauren, that she should have, or you're, 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 I get the sense that you think she should have uh, kept her money uh, invested. Mm -hmm. This flies in the face of what we know, particularly since 2007 and no. 2008. And Correct. The question from many experts right now is why isn't the stock market tanking? We know that in 2007 and 8, the Federal Reserve, the, uh, the Fed, was through facilities that they created, giving many of these, multi, uh, these banks and financial entities 16, and some, some economists have said 29 trillion. Mm -hmm. And the reason we are now where we are in the market has a lot to do with what is not being said, with the stock buybacks, the money that the banks are loaning to these corporations, they're buying back their own stocks. Um, they're staying afloat through uh, not putting the money back into um, their workers or back into uh, ways of making the businesses better, but through speculation. So we, there are experts who do expect to see, and there's tremendous volatility right now. I can't imagine, and I, I, that's why I, I'm a little concerned about the message that I'm getting from the play, because I don't really hear enough being said about the mother and the daughters, the choices that they've made. I, 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 so I you're saying they saying, should they should be cautious. Is that what you're saying? I think that you're you're enamored with the market, you as a playwright. Um, so, 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 listen. There's this thing called the, that we publish called the quill, right? And um, so I want I want you to Google it. It's called the quilt. It is, it's a quilt that actually shows like um, all of the returns of all of every single financial market there is. So it's it's like the S and P 500. It's the Russell. It's like the Russell 2000. It's the bond market. It's it's um, uh, structured credit. It's it's cash. So and it literally looks like a quilt because every single market is like a little like colored uh, square on this thing, and um, it probably is like 20 years, right? So it and it shows every year what the returns are for that in every single market, okay, for 20 years, right? So my point in saying is this is that yes, markets go up and markets go down, but in the long run, the returns are positive. 
So that's why in the long run you always have to stay invested, right? So yes, there, there, the, the, there was TARP money that was put into the markets, and yes, you know, the, the banks did like, you know, but they the can't have closures, the yeah. like, There's this massive transfer wealth, yeah. and the stock market has a lot. That money, but, but the TARP money's come out. Like, we can have a longer conversation about this offline, but <laughs> my point is that um, in the long run, the financial markets are the places you want to put your money. So you seem to be saying, but is a, a stock is a stock market going to make thirty percent every year? Absolutely not. But in the long run, you absolutely have to be invested in the long run. But you're saying, if if I'm if I'm hearing you correctly, no matter what has happened historically, maybe things are different now in a way that we're not acknowledging. You mean the kind of capitalism that we are? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, plays, plays tend, tend to uh, withstand the test of time very well. And I think, I think what, we have, uh, what we have really dug into in, in a really different and interesting way tonight is um, the metaphor, the parallel of money. You say, like, over time, um, we're glad we're invested, right? It's a little like humanity. I think that's what we do in the theater. Over time, good and bad, and through all weather, we stay connected. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we are obligated to wrap up quite soon. Um, one, one last comment on the play, yes, maybe? Only a technical observation. Yes. We were, I think a lot of us were not privileged enough to, in, to even hear technically the questions from the audience. So These were, questions. You know, so, so your answer, or the answer that came then, it was, you couldn't really uh, appreciate it because you never understood the question. That's a technical observation. For the next one. Repeat oh, repeat the questions. questions. Yes, indeed. And we, and we usually do. I think it's just such a small group. Sorry, I wish I had heard that earlier. We would have been sure to do that. Um, we do need to say thank you to our guests and thank you to Stan.